And this is just a short video on textual criticism, this time with respect to the Septuagint. The link that you see on screen is already in my brain out NT threads and um, you'll find it right here in the playlist, the head of the playlist. It's by a guy named Marcos and what he basically does is he, d he does a survey of the history of the LXX and how it's been regarded the textual criticism on it, and it's really important um, because the New Testament quotes the LXX so often. That's why I made this playlist, partly to show that the King James only people can't read Greek because they can't tell the age of the text in the LXX. Now, what we call the LXX today is not really altogether the LXX. It's the original um, LXX text by the Jews under uh, Ptolemy. But it's also been, there's been a lot of additions to it over the centuries. And so what we call the LXX text today is really a composite. Now if you can't read Greek, like the King James only people can't read it, you can't tell what's Old Greek versus New Greek. All right, so they make arguments to other ignorant people who can't read it and therefore don't know anything about the Old Testament LXX and what is genuinely LXX from 300 BC versus the additions later on. Okay, the LXX is a translation of the Hebrew, and the reason why it's so valuable, besides the fact that the New Testament quotes from it so often is that it had recourse to manuscripts of the Hebrew of the third century BC that we don't have today. All, all of our Hebrews manuscripts, okay, are Old Testament manuscripts in Hebrew and Aramaic. Um, the latest copies we have, I mean the earliest copies we have, are sometime around 700 BC. They're copies. They're not originals. They're copies. All right, so to have something of 300 BC that might be based on older copies is pretty significant. And so it becomes important in textual criticism, you're always comparing the words in one copy to the words in another copy to see if both copies are right or if they contain the same text and if not, why? This is, this is a voting thing that God has obviously ordained all right, for us to all vote on how well do we want to know this Bible. So you have to fight to know it. It's not simple. And obviously the KJV people, they don't want to fight. They don't like the fact that God meant that you had to really dig into the Word to know what it says. They want Him to do it the baby style. And by the way, they don't care if they even prejudice and spit on Christ by claiming the Bible wasn't perfect until 1611, which of course means that the, the Bible Christ had was no good. That is the central contention of mainstream King James only movement today. That Christ didn't even have a good Bible. Excuse me? So that's why I'm spending so much time in this, and that's why this book is so important. I'm not going to read it all to you. But what I wanted to stress in this video, first of all, the link will be in the video description so you can read this book yourself. But what I wanted to stress in this video description is, is the kind of idiocy that scholarship gets into. Bear in mind, scholars are human beings. They're a lot smarter than you and me, but they also get into problems because they're a lot smarter than you and me. And one of the problems they got into is right here and unfortunately Google has screwed up the use of its own wonderful search engine so I can't highlight the text anymore like I used to be able to do. Um, but just read this first paragraph and I'll read it aloud so you can see it. Until the close of the 19th century, Biblical Greek was understood to be the Greek of the Bible as opposed to 
secular Greek. Some theologians, impressed by the peculiarity of these meaning Bible texts, the Semitic loans, the Hebraizing constructions, etc., had reached the conclusion that it was a special language of the Bible, which in some way had come under divine inspiration. Okay, what would give anybody in his right mind that impression? When everybody knew that the LXX was a translation of the Hebrew. You see, scholars get nutty too. So until the ninth century, the scholarship on this topic didn't critically examine the fact that, for example, a lot of the LXX text depends on you knowing the Greek plays, depends on you knowing Greek cultural idiom and expression and meaning and history of the words in order for you to get what they're saying in translation. Instead, the scholars trying to be nice to the Bible actually dissed the Bible by not paying attention to the fact that no, it's a secular language translated from the original or as much as they had of the original in those days. Okay? So this kind of discussion is really important to read. He goes through the history of how the Bible, in particular the Greek Old Testament, was regarded versus the modern scholarship on it today. And it's really important to know that for two big reasons. Number one, you'll realize that this Bible, every single, literally every single dot in all the the text we have has been fought over by someone. What that tells you is that Satan's very alive and active in trying to dissuade you from believing in the text. And number two, it tells you how God's employed an army of people who often disagree with each other of every denomination in Christendom and Judaism who yet preserve the text. I mean, we're all very fallible people. Okay? See? Humanism. Humanism has influenced the, the, what we consider to be Bible text. Humanism? Okay, but does that mean a bad influence or a good influence? Well, both. And you begin to see the, the war about the Bible and you begin to see how God started rolling out, and this was really important, how God started rolling out, and it's a really dramatic story, beginning in the late 1700s and 1800s, older manuscripts that we didn't have. That's why we know that the King James only Greek, you know, basis from Erasmus, that's why we know it's wrong. God started rolling out older, better texts than Erasmus could get in the 1800s. And why did God wait that long? Because that's when people started asking God for them. So what does that tell you? That tells you that this battle of the Bible is a voting thing. See, here are some of the, see, in 1887, papyrology really started to begin with all these papyri that were discovered. Best period in Christian scholarship is still the 1800s, the beginning through the, the whole of the 1800s. That's when we got our best manuscripts. That tells you that people asked God, and what did God do? He said yes. So if you got a doubt about your Bible, ask God. A lot of the scholars don't ask God, but a lot of them do. So this is the voting history right here in the 1800s especially, most important period in, in history since, you know, the first century A.D., right here. People started asking God, oh God, please, we need to verify that these words are yours. And so for the entire period of the 1800s, that's what God did is he rolled it out. And of course the latest rollout was the Dead Sea Scrolls, most of which is not Bible at all, but a bunch of idiots who are living in caves. But you know what? They had some portions of the Bible with them.
So God uses people who believe in him and people who don't. He uses screwed up Christians, screwed up Jews, screwed up scholars, and the good ones, both, to reveal and preserve his word. I submit to you this most dramatic, exciting story in history. But because, you know, you got to read, through, you know, see, look at this. This is all a lot of, it's scholarly wording, and it's important it be scholarly wording, but forever and ever and ever it takes to get to the point, because these poor scholars have to keep quoting other scholars. So you know what? It's boring sometimes to read this material, but it's worth it. And I submit to you that if you're willing to spend the time to read this book and the other books and websites I'm going to put in this TC series, you're going you're gonna to see if you ask God. You're going to see a story unfold that proves to you just how much God is today involved in proving His Word. And if you got doubts, ask Him. Hi, God, are these words in this verse really yours? How do I prove that? And then just stand back and wait for the answer, honey. That's what I did. That's what I do. That's what you can do. And you don't have to be a scholar, but you have to act like one to get the answer. Now, here's the thing I wanted to focus on in the video. This is, again, Natalio Marcos's own conclusions. And they make so much sense, I don't know why they weren't regarded sooner. Okay, now I'm going to skip over the scholars he names because he spent a lot of time explaining what those scholars said. That's his job. If you're a scholar, you have to constantly quote other scholars and sort of weave into the, the discourse you're making what everybody else has said to show that A, you read them, and B, that you understand, you know, what's been said, and C, to credit them. Okay. So I'm, I'm skipping over all that. I just want to focus on this, these two pages. It's really important. So just sit back, close your eyes. I'm going to read what he says. It's that important. The outright achievement of Diceman Thumb, definitive in terms of methodology, has been to rescue biblical text from the domain of theology in order to study it not on its own, but as an integral part of Hellenistic Greek. I'm going to stop here and comment. Why didn't these people understand this earlier? That's the first thing I knew without being told when I started reading the LXX. It's Greek. It's the language of a people alive then. All the words in a language have a cultural basis. You have to know the etymology of those words. And obviously the writers knew them. That's why they used the words they did in translation. Duh. It would have never occurred to me to think of the Greek of the LXX, or even the Hebrew for that matter, as a sacred language. It's a language. God always expresses himself in the Old Testament in human terms. Yeah, because we have to get that information that way. So God uses cultural idiom in Hebrew related to the times of the people he was talking to. So why would we ever have any other standard for language? I don't know. So, you know, kudos to Marcos for saying the obvious. Okay, now I'm resuming reading. The secular and sterile discussion between Hellenists and Hebraizers has been resolved, as has the idea of Biblical Greek as a special language, a suitable vehicle for the expression of religious movement. Today, in the past opened up by Diceman and Thumb, belong projects such as Horsley's on the new documents to illustrate primitive Christianity, or studies such as Silva's, which uses the analysis of bilingualism and the approaches of modern linguistics. However, the various approaches that we have seen from the close of the 19th century, such as inscriptions, papyri, bilingualism, or the literary works of Koine, came to the fore in research. They show us that we are only beginning to understand post-classical Greek. Each monograph discovers new contacts between Biblical Greek and the linguistic area ex being explored, and as a result, shifts the perspective to that particular area of comparison. Thus, a systematic study of all the documentation of the Hellenistic period is required. 
popular as well as literary to be able to place the Greek of the Bible in its correct location. Now here I'm going to stop again and comment. Duh! That's how you have to do it with the Old Testament too. What is the first rule of hermeneutics? You have to interpret the words you're reading in light of the author and his audience at the time of writing. So, so what happened here? Did all the brains turn off? Suddenly with the LXX, it's a brand new sp spiritual language. You see what happens to scholars. They're really good. They're really bright. They deserve to get a million dollar a year salary. But if they don't use Wong John 1-9, they go into the toilet in their conclusions. Thank God you got somebody like this who's bringing the common sense back into the ver you know review of scripture. I'll read that sentence again. Thus a systematic study of all the documentation of the Hellenistic period is required, popular as well as literary, to be able to place the Greek of the Bible in its correct location. In reality, the language of the LXX has not been examined thoroughly in light of the enormous number of papyrus documents. Although we know enough about the popular Greek of Egypt in the Ptolemaic period, our knowledge of the literary use of Greek in the same period is very inexact. The lack of studies of the language of post-classical Greek is too obvious a fact to be stressed. The Koine does not have to be as uniform as the manuals insist. Today it is increasingly accepted that most of the morphological innovations of modern Greek go back to the period of Koine. It is also possible that there were greater degrees of dialectical differentiation than we know through the process of linguistic informity imposed by a great section of literary Koine and the way of speaking well and writing well spread by the Atticist movement. Now here I want to comment again and Maybe I'm going to stop talking about what he says at this point. When you read the Greek of either the Old Testament or the New, you notice one thing really quickly. It's lively. When I talk to you, or you talk to me, sometimes you will use slang. Sometimes you will use a, a special slang, like LOL is the slang of, of chat rooms. And then in the next sentence you'll say something like differentiation or morphological innovations. And you just skip immediately from slang to more erudite vocabulary without even thinking. Why? Because you're fluent in both. So why do we expect that the Old Testament Greek and the New Testament Greek are going to somehow be less mixed? See, that's another brain fart by scholars. And unfortunately, this kind of, this kind of problem makes it imp, you know, very difficult to study the history of textual criticism of the Bible because everybody keeps going off on tangents. And every tangent has something good in it and, and a lot of bad stuff. So it makes the study of Bible unnecessarily complex. Occam's razor, simplest thing. Just think that the people writing the translation, or even in the original Hebrew, God is using a mix of slang and, and fancy vocabulary in order to communicate. So why do we expect everybody else not to do the same? So when you're reading the Bible, if you know how to read the Greek, it should be no surprise to you that sometimes, for example, in the New Testament, Paul gets very coarse, very sarcastic, very coarse. So does the Lord in the Gospels. Okay, so too the LXX, the Old Testament. Sometimes it just soars with attic atticisms because that was regarded as, you know, drama Greek and elegant and high class, la la la. And then sometimes it gets right down in the gutter. There are F words in the Old Testament Hebrew. Okay, one of them said by Potiphar's wife. Paul uses the S word in Philippians 3.8. And then he also uses fancy atticisms, like the Ionic dative in, in Ephesians 2.10. There's very fancy Greek used by Mary in the Magnificat, and she mixes it with common Koine words. 
The same thing is true of Isaiah 53, 10 and 11. It mixes common koine with atticism. What I'm trying to tell you is every verse in the Bible has a mix. Okay, so, greater degrees of dialectical differentiation. Well, maybe not. Maybe it's just common speech that mixes dialects or mixes modes of speech in the same verse. That's the way we talk. That's the way they talked. Okay, so again, I want to... I, this is really great because the guy is coming back to a common sense idea of what scripture writing really means, whether it's Hebrew, Greek, Aramaic, okay, and even in translation. All right, so maybe I should close this out now. I'm still reading now from his own conclusions. Now on page 15. Alongside this deepening at all levels of the production of coin A, more attention should be paid to the phenomenon of bilingualism and its repercussions in the area of syntax. Hello, that's where I'm commenting in. And I comment on his sentence there. Hello, Paul was bilingual, trilingual, so was everybody else at the time Paul wrote. And you know what? Guess what? That was also true at the time of the LXX. You had to be bilingual, hello, in order to translate from a Hebrew Bible with parts in Aramaic in order to translate it into Greek. And of course, the people reading your translation would have to sort of be bilingual also in order to know if your translation was any good. A lot of people in the world especially in Israel, have historically been bilingual and trilingual. Why? Because people from other nations go through their nation. They invade. They trade. Hello! Most people in the world are, are bilingual or trilingual, at least. In order to live in India, you have to know at least six different dialects. Just within the 30-mile radius. Radius. Words are words, whether they're your language or somebody else's language. And if somebody has words like we say, to pay, that's a French word. We all know what that means in English, but it's a French word. Lucifer is a Latin word, and everybody but Gail Ripplinger knows it means morning star. We have a lot of foreign words in our English language, and always have. English developed out of foreign languages. It's a polyglot language by nature, English. So what's so surprising that the Bible in Greek or Hebrew is actually a product of bilingual development? Duh! All right, I better continue reading before I lose my temper. Now I'm at the second sentence on page 15. Most of the peculiar features of the Greek of Egypt can usually be explained by the influence of Coptic. One should not speak of the vulgarisms of the papyri, some of which also have literary merit, but in each case it needs to be determined which phenomenon is due to the inner development of Hellenistic Greek and which depends on or has traces of the influence of the Coptic. And given the difficulty of this distinction in many cases, since Coptic is a language with a very simple construction, it has to be determined in which cases a particular linguistic phenomenon could be the result of both tendencies combined. The same analysis has to be applied to the Greek of the Bible. It is necessary for studies of the language of the New Testament to be extended to the same level and to the same degree to the Greek of the LXX. It is also necessary to use all the linguistic information provided by the intertestamental pseudepigraphic writings to trace as far as possible the successive stages in the development of Biblical Greek. This is because the Greek of the Pentateuch, for a translation Greek written in the 3rd century BCE in Egypt, is not the same as the New Testament Greek or Palestinian Greek of the lives of the prophets of the 1st, 2nd century CE. Even so, the many common features allow it to be studied as a single linguistic complex that has its own identity in spite of the differences in, in detail, for the influence of the first translation of the LXX extends even to the books that were not translated from Hebrew or Aramaic, such as the New Testament or certain pseudepigraphic writings. At the close of this long survey of biblical history of Biblical Greek,
from the first reactions by the fathers of the church until the present, it would seem that there has been little progress if we consider that the problem of the existence or not of a Jewish Greek around which at various stages the discussion has revolved, although it is dismissed today in most publications, continues to some extent latent under the name of Translation Greek. However, the question of Biblical Greek is not banal, even though it has remained hidden and has compromised the background to impassioned discussions not only in the Reformation and post-Renaissance periods, but even in our own day. Melanchthon's statement that scriptura no potest intelegi teolognice nisi antea intellecta sit, sit grammatice continues to be valid. I apologize for my bad Latin, I haven't spoken it in 20 years. It must be clearly understood that the only way to come close to ancient thinking is inductively through language and not the reverse. And we can only understand this language through analysis as complete as possible of all the documents in the widest sense of the past that are available to us. Although the impact on the language of any important cultural religious movement must be taken into account, Barr's comments on Kittle's lexicon of the New Testament should keep us alert to the constant danger of going beyond the limits of semantics, inserting into the text elements of interpretation that really belong to biblical theology. And with that cogent conclusion, I, can, I complete this video.